Ireland. My name is Molly Scott Cato and I'm the Green Member of the European Parliament for South West England and also Gibraltar. And I'm doing this Facebook Live on uh, Facebook today and it's called Ask Me Anything. So you can ask me any questions you want to, just type your question into the comments box. Anything you like, I imagine quite a lot of them will be about European issues, what my life's like in the European Parliament. Anything to do with green issues, I'm also an economist, so you might like to ask me things about that. And obviously, I dare say, some questions about Brexit might come along. So I'll answer your questions here live as they come in. Do make sure you get in as early as possible to make sure there's time for your question. And I'll also be answering some questions submitted in advance. So while you're getting comfortable and warming up your typing fingers, I'll start by answering a warm-up question. And that one is, what does a typical week in the life of the Green MEP for South West England look like? So I have to say, in response to that question, I don't really have any typical weeks. I would say I have four different kinds of weeks. So next week, on Monday in fact, I'm going to Strasbourg. And that's the week when we all get together in the Parliament and we do the final voting on pieces of legislation. It's also really busy times, at least Tuesday and Wednesday are incredibly long days. Monday we get there and we start and we debate through the evening and Thursday we debate in the morning and then we go back to our constituencies. And usually I do need the Friday off because it's quite exhausting that week. Then we have committee weeks. So most of our detailed work on legislation happens in our committees and those weeks happen in Brussels and that's usually two weeks out of the month. Um, and in those weeks I'll be dealing with quite detailed, complex legislative proposals on things like tax and finance. I'm working a lot on sustainable finance at the moment and that's my main committee, the Economics and Monetary Affairs Committee. And then I also work on the Agriculture Committee and there I've worked, for example, to limit the use of antibiotics on farms. We're trying to get glyphosate and nasty pesticide banned. Uh, really trying to improve the environmental standards on our farms across Europe. That's what we do as Greens on that committee. Um, and then we have what they call turquoise weeks, which is weeks when I don't have to be in the Parliament, and then I spend time here in the South West visiting people, checking out projects, uh, finding out what the European Union is doing, what it's funding across the region, and also finding out about things that are useful when I go back to uh, my work in the Parliament. So, for example, here in Bournemouth, a while back I visited JP Morgan to learn what they're thinking about sustainable finance. I can then feed that into my legislative work. Yesterday I was visiting some local food um, farming projects and some farms near Bristol, so again that feeds into my agriculture work. So I try and link up the two bits of my work really, and that's, um, that's what my life's like. Monday to Thursday I'm usually in Brussels or Strasbourg. Weekends I can come back here to get involved in constituency activities, and about one week in six I have a week that's all spent in the constituency. It's a lot of travel, I spend most of my life on a train, but I'm quite good at uh, travelling by train now. So. Okay, thanks Molly. Uh, I'm, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm the producer with the Local Green Party. Uh, I am ready to um, pass on your live questions to Molly and any comments you have on her answers. Um, do you get your questions in as soon as possible. Uh, for the time being, we will um, take an advanced question from Billy Bran. Um, who says, Hi Molly, I've followed you for a while now and you've been fantastic at standing up for British citizens' rights in the EU. Would you be able to help your Dutch colleagues at the D66 in supporting them gaining dual passports for Brits in the Netherlands and Dutch in the UK? Thank you for all you've done. Well, thank you very much, Billy, for your question and thanks for appreciating the work we've all been trying to do, I think, as British MEPs, making sure that we protect the citizens' rights of non-UK EU citizens here in Britain and also EU UK citizens living and working and making their lives elsewhere in the EU. Obviously with Brexit there's been a large number of lives torn apart and turned upside down and it's been really heartbreaking actually to receive emails from people who just had made their plans on the basis of us continuing with our EU membership and now feel completely unsettled and devastated in many cases. So you're asking me a fairly technical thing there. I understand about D66, who sit in the ALDE group, the Liberals in the Parliament, and from the beginning the Liberals have positioned themselves quite strongly in terms of supporting continued citizens' rights for Brits. And so, for example, Charles Gurens, one of their members from Luxembourg, supported the idea of being able to buy your way into EU citizenship once we leave the EU. 
But I'm a bit concerned about the implications of all of this because essentially, as I see it, well, it's, it's the law that your European citizenship is not independent of being a citizen of a country that's a member of the EU. And if we said you can just buy citizenship as like a bundle of rights, then to me that would take away from the very important political commitment to Europe and the European project that you currently have to show in order to be an EU citizen. So I'm sort of wary about how citizens' rights are allocated. We have recently been quite active in the area of um, what will happen to citizens' rights if there's a no-deal Brexit. So we are encouraging countries to allow visa-free travel and extended citizens' rights to people who've already made those decisions to live and work in another EU country. Um, I think you're raising the question about the Netherlands because if I'm correct, you can't hold a Dutch passport and another passport. So for example, with Belgium or with Ireland, they're both, both perfectly happy for you to have their passport and keep your British passport. And I think that's not the situation in the Netherlands. So if you're asking me to try and put pressure on so that you can hold a, a Dutch passport and a British passport, then I, I would agree with you. I think that's part of the move we need to make to have sort of less focus on where you're actually from. Um, and yeah, I don't see a problem with doing that. Um, there's a slight problem with D66, because uh, I'm not sure how powerful they are now in their national parliament, because as you know, the Netherlands has a very fragmented political system, lots of parties. But I can certainly uh, look into that. It would be useful actually if you could email my office and, and suggest that, and I can then follow up. Um, otherwise the note might get lost in transit. But thank you for that really interesting question. And I don't know what your situation is, but I really hope that you find security and obviously we're all totally unsettled by this crazy way that the government is playing out the Brexit uh, nightmare really. But I hope that your situation is secure and you manage to find a way to, to live and work and have your relationships where you choose whatever happens with Brexit. Okay, um, so we'll take our first live question now uh, from Victoria Magnususka. Uh, she says, hi, can you give us a brief overview of how Brexit could influence the environment? Well, yeah, that's a big issue. We've got a, a whole document on that actually published by the Green Party, which I can't remember quite what it's called, but again, if you email me, I can let you have it, or you can just search on Green Party Environment Brexit and it'll probably pop up. But I would say the gist of it is that about 85% of the law that protects the environment in this country, whether we think about clean beaches, whether we think about protection of habitats for wildlife, whether we think about clean water and so on, most of that law is EU law, which we've then implemented. And obviously when we joined the European Union back in the 70s, we were known as the dirty man of Europe and we had very low environmental standards. So the worry is that if Brexit goes ahead and we leave the EU, will we maintain the same high standards? And so you all have heard Michael Gove, the Environment Secretary, talking about this green Brexit and promising he is going to keep those high standards. But there's absolutely nothing in terms of legal guarantees. And I just am really suspicious of Conservative politicians who, let's face it, have been trashing our environment nationally and fighting the EU law because we're opposing them in the European Parliament. And now they're saying they're going to defend that law when there aren't other EU countries kind of holding them back. And I'm just personally totally unconvinced about that. <clears throat> so one of the things we've said as the Green Party is that we need to have an independent court overseeing environmental law because as we, um, one of the things that the withdrawal bill did was that it brought a lot of European law into our law, but an awful lot of that is happening by what they call statutory instruments, so MPs aren't themselves investigating um, and having oversight of the way that process happens, and obviously you can't just cut and paste law from one jurisdiction to another. So it's really concerning that bits of law might be getting lost, and even if we um, transfer that law effectively, still we will be uh, facing the situation where there's no independent appeal beyond your country. So if we think about air pollution, client earth were able to challenge the British government that they weren't uh, protecting the quality of air as they should have been by taking them to the European Court of Justice. Now if we don't manage to stop Brexit then we will lose access to the European Court of Justice. So we'll be very much stuck in this island run by Conservatives with no independent recourse and that makes me quite nervous. And just a quick final thing about the precautionary principle, which is a, a fundamental principle of European law. So, for example, it's the reason we don't have genetically modified crops in Europe, because if we can't be sure that something's safe, then we don't allow it. And this is a strong contrast to the way laws made in the US, where effectively they allow 
new developments, new technologies, and they just say, well, we'll wait to see, and if they're not safe, then somebody will be damaged, and they can then take a legal action afterwards. So it's, you can see why it's called the precautionary principle, and at the moment the precautionary principle is not being transferred into UK law. And as a Green, it's something I rely on all the time in my work in the Parliament, and as a fundamental principle it's really useful in terms of conservation and preservation of systems and protection of public health and environment. So it's really <coughs> worrying that that won't be part of our law um, in the future if Brexit happens. Okay, uh, the next live question is from uh, Liz Mullings. Uh, do you think they will crash out of Europe rather than facilitate a European Parliament election? I don't think no deal is going to happen. I mean, if we think our way back to earlier in the Brexit process, no deal was, a, was something that was created by the Conservatives negotiating team to try and put pressure on the European side to come closer towards them in the agreement. Nobody wanted no deal to happen, and the reason's obvious. It's completely catastrophic. It means there's no proper planning, even for things like basic things like transport, import of drugs, movement of food, movement of people. You know, the whole point of having a deal is that we have a, a, a sort of transition process and two years to make the changes we need to make. So we're absolutely unprepared for no deal. And no deal has now moved from being something that people made up just to use as a bargaining chip that they never intended to really happen, to no deal being something that now 42% of British people say they support. And a lot of those people say they support it because they think no deal means we'll just carry on as we are now. So. Um, I, I don't think we'll crash out with no deal. Parliament has made it clear that they don't want that to happen. There are lots of ways of avoiding that. Obviously, at the moment, the Prime Minister's kind of created this chicken game, and she says as we get closer to the edge, either the EU will crack, it's fairly clear that's not going to happen, or the MPs in Parliament will crack so that they accept her deal. But as long as they, the MPs stay true to what they think is best for the country, as we near the cliff edge, at, at any point, the Prime Minister can go back to the European side and say, look, you know, my deal's not going through, I would like to either have an extension of Article 50 or revoke Article 50, and both of those will stop no deal from happening. So I'm convinced that the Prime Minister doesn't want no deal to happen. It's possible it could happen by accident, because there's just so much mess at the moment, but I'm fairly sure that actually that won't happen. So, um, you know, where are we going? It's quite hard to say. Um, but actually, rationally, we're still in the same place we were before this latest round of um, shenanigans in Parliament. The Prime Minister made some progress in Parliament uniting her party, but only by promising something that was impossible. In other words, by saying she'd go back to the EU side and get them to change the backstop. And it's been completely clear to me as an MP MEP that the deal as negotiated, as agreed by both sides, was fixed and closed, and there was never going to be any chance of reopening it. So basically that was just deceitfulness from the Prime Minister and from the government to try and bully some of her backbenchers to look like they were supporting something. But there's absolutely no point in Parliament supporting something that is either in itself internally inconsistent and therefore impossible, or something that the EU side will not accept. So really we're in exactly the same place we were before Christmas, you know, when her deal was not acceptable, it was then actually voted down, and since then, nothing has really changed. And this is why, even though um, people are now quite despondent about the people's vote, actually it's no less likely now than it was before, because there's still no way out of the Brexit impasse. There's three, there's two possible futures. There's the Prime Minister's deal negotiated with the EU. No, I'm writing off no deal, because it's so catastrophic, I don't think it'll happen. Then there's the Prime Minister's deal, or there's carrying on in the EU. Both of those are so far removed from what people voted for in June 2016 that I think it would be unconscionable to take either of those routes without checking with the people of Britain first. So this is why I think a people's vote is a democratic necessity. And as the mess carries on, I think it will, it will come to seem the only way out of the situation that we're in. I'm not sure I answered all of the question there. There was a lot to say about Brexit, but I think maybe... I, what was the last bit? Um. Do you think they will crash out of Europe rather than facilitate a European Parliament election? Oh yes, that's right, the Parliament election. So look, I think what the Prime Minister will try and do is get an extension to the end of June, because even though the European elections in this country would have taken place on the 23rd of May, the Parliament won't actually come together as a constituted body until the 1st of July. So there isn't really that much problem with us having an extension to the end of June. Um, I don't, think they'll, I don't think they'll crash out anyway, but I think 
the, the trouble is if there's still no agreement in Parliament, all that's done is push the cliff edge forward by three months. And it's still difficult to, to organise a people's vote in this amount of time. So, I mean, I think the Prime Minister would choose a people's vote rather than crashing out. Um, but I can see why, if you haven't had a people's vote first, it would be pretty unpopular to organise a European election. And also pretty unpleasant for people like me that will have to stand in that election, because obviously... Uh, the extreme Brexit people will engage in a lot of intimidation as they did last time and it will turn into a sort of proxy referendum on Brexit and I think that would be pretty unfortunate. I mean last time the European elections were something like a proxy referendum on Europe and so we elected more UKIP MEPs than other, any other MEPs and they just have been appalling, they haven't done their job, they don't turn up at committees, they don't represent the people of Britain um, and so you know, I, I think it would be really unfortunate if we if we went through something like that again. So my ideal situation would be um, organise a people's vote, win that people's vote, make a decision to stay in the EU and then hold European elections. Okay, um, the next live question is from Sheridan Dingle. Uh, how will Brexit impact on the South West in particular, in your view? Mm, well... I mean, obviously, as a person who represents five million people in the southwest, I have a sort of list of vulnerable people, and the top of my list are the people I represent who live in Gibraltar, 32,000 of them. And you've probably heard that at each stage of the negotiations, the Spanish have made a sort of threat that they will um, make a claim over the territorial integrity of Gibraltar. And the British government has said they'll resist that, but obviously Gibraltar is much stronger uh, its position is much stronger while we're in the EU than if we leave. So, you know, there's a risk there. And then we have, next on my list, I have the people of Cornwall, who at present are in the highest uh, category of need for financial support, because it's a former industrial area and it's less than 75%. The GDP on average is less than 75% of the EU as a whole. So it's received significant levels of funding from the EU and those will not be available so of course I've been writing to the government to say what's coming instead and they say the Shared Prosperity Fund but um, the Shared Prosperity Fund is just three words there is no more detail than that about what they actually mean and so I'm not convinced that the Conservative government in London will send the same amount of money to Cornwall so that would be a really significant blow to what is still a depressed economy in that part of the region then I've got all the farmers who are next on my list, especially sheep farmers, because at the moment about, I think it's about 80% of sheep produced, no, 50% of lamb meat produced goes into the EU and is exported and 80% goes into the EU. And if we are outside the single market, then that will be facing a tariff of 40%. So it will not be able to compete with New Zealand lamb. So we've got quite a lot of sheep farmers in the southwest. Incidentally, dairy farmers will also be having to compete in a global market without the protection of being in the EU. And um, although, of course, we've had all this talk about these great trade deals, the only country that Fox has signed a trade deal with is the Faroe Islands. The Faroe Islands is not a country, it's a protectorate of Denmark. It's absolutely tiny and insignificant. So what situation will be facing the farmers I represent? They will face tariffs exporting into the single market anywhere beyond Europe. They're currently exporting within a framework that the EU has negotiated and that will no longer be available to them from the end of next month and there's nothing to replace it. So farmers will be in trouble. I've already talked about the impacts on the environment. Now I've got all the manufacturing industry in the southwest which relies on ease of components moving backwards and forwards. The best example of that is the Honda factory in Swindon which relies on just-in-time production. It was built by the Japanese in Swindon so that they could export goods from there into the single market. So the cars that the, the Honda cars driven in Europe and sold in Europe are all made at Swindon and um, they will not be able to carry on with that plant if we are no longer in the single market. The customs checks and just the friction that will be introduced between those um, markets will increase costs and next time there's a competition it's very hard to see that Swindon will be able to win that competition so you know that's another change manufacturing will be very severely affected small businesses across the region are already re-registering in countries that are part of the single market particularly Estonia where it's very easy to register a company so this is so if you say what's going to change this is all about jobs loss of jobs difficulty of exporting being locked out of these kind of systems it's two more things just the health service and 
universities, I'm sitting in a university now, universities are part of a global network of research institutions. British universities have been incredibly successful both in attracting foreign students and in attracting research funding. Both of those will be very difficult, if not impossible, um, if we leave the EU, uh, particularly if we don't buy our way back into the new research programme. Um, and lastly, the health service and care, social care. Obviously, we have a lot of uh, EU nationals working in social care and in the health service and um, for various reasons to do with probably the, the fall in the value of the pound and just the difficulty of living in a country that's outside the EU, they're much more likely to go and work in other countries like Germany, a lot of them are already doing that. So, you know, we'll face funding shortages, uh, sorry, staff shortages and then increased wages and, you know, given that NHS is really struggling, it will really reduce the quality of Healthcare. So, I mean, you know, I could go on, but I've talked a long time about your question. So, um, yeah, hopefully that's enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, just a comment on that answer from Hagen Rose. Um, he says, Oh dear Cornwall, people in manufacturing and farmers are screwed. I hope none of them were daft enough to vote for this. Mm. Um, well, just to, quickly in response to that, I mean, I really don't think it helps to. Um, you know, feel either angry or patronising towards people who voted to leave. Obviously, I represent everybody in this patch, whether they voted remain or leave. And I think it really is helpful to kind of think that people might have made quite marginal choices. It's not like I'm a leave, I'm a remain. It's not like football clubs. It's people who made a difficult decision um, on the basis, actually, of very deceitful information in many cases. And I would just say that a lot of people, what they were doing when they voted leave was just shaking their fists at David Cameron, and I felt like doing that as well. So I don't think we should all either turn against each other or be forced to lose some of the things we really value just because it was an opportunity for people who've been crushed by a Conservative government to try and repay David Cameron for that. What we've got to do is find things we share and find ways of, of making a better future for all of us. And I think whatever outcome is in terms of Brexit, we need an absolutely fundamental revision of the way our politics works so the country actually starts working for everybody and not just for the wealthy few. Okay, uh, the next question is from Emma Short. Uh, she says, hi, I'm writing on behalf of an eco-committee in a school in Dorset. Uh, how do you think schools can do their bit to fight climate change? Well, I think schools are already doing their bit to fight climate change because young people, in my view, are much, much better informed than people my age about climate change. And that's just as well because, to be honest with you, people of my generation have completely failed to deal with this problem as urgently as we should have done. And I think younger people have a much better understanding of the sort of behavioural changes you need to make. So I would say, I will say that uh, you can involve yourself in the school strikes, which happen every Friday. Follow Greta Thunberg, Swedish environmentalist who's doing amazing work where young people are just walking out of school and saying we will not go to school. There's no point in being educated for a future that doesn't exist. Until politicians deal with climate change, we're not going to carry on going to school. So that's some direct action you can take. But I think also there's, there's ways in which you can adjust the way your school works. For example, an awful lot of people drive <coughs> to school and that's kind of bad from lots of points of view. It means that young people aren't getting exercise, it means that there's a lot of traffic, unnecessary traffic, and of course there's the climate related emissions as well. So I think anything you can do to encourage a school to support people walking or cycling, you know, safe routes to school. If schools go out and ask for safe routes to their school, then you know that can really help to reduce those emissions. Um, and just generally, you know, uh, all public institutions should be taking an energy audit of the way they work, of the way their buildings work. Are there opportunities to generate um, energy? You know, can you have solar panels on your school? Look at the way the, the school dinners work, if you still have school meals. You know, can you think about more locally produced food and diets and so on? I mean, it, I think an energy audit of a school would be actually really interesting and educational and could feed into the curriculum and also find opportunities for reducing your climate emissions. But I think teachers are doing a really good job sharing the, the news about what we have to do about climate change with uh, pupils in schools, and I'm sure your teachers are doing that. And then, you know, maybe we could try and extend that to action that the school could itself take in terms of how it operates and its energy use and uh, transport and so on. Okay, uh, the next question is from Barbara Leonard. Uh, how did we end up with so many hopeless, inhumane and selfish politicians in <laughs> Westminster? How do they sleep at night? 
I find it really hard to be rude about politicians. Look, one thing I will say, I'm not convinced that the politicians, the 650 people we've got there at Westminster, are the best representatives we could have found. So something's going wrong with the way we choose our politicians. And one of the things that I think is wrong is that a lot of them have safe seats. They can see it as a career. Um, and that's a lot of that's to do with our electoral system. So in our electoral system, if you're you know, about, let's say, 500 of the 650 seats are safe seats. That's to say they'll either be won by one party or the other party. So we have a two-party system, and both those parties have safe seats. So if we think about here in Bournemouth, for example, the overwhelming majority of local politicians are conservative. Although probably, I don't know, not much more than half of the people in Bournemouth actually vote conservative. But because you have to win a majority in each place to get elected, that means that even though nearly half the people in every place, let's say 49% in every ward in Bournemouth voted Labour or Green, um, those people, those parties would still get nobody elected. And the 51% for Conservatives would make sure that the whole council was made up of Conservatives. And that gives the Conservative Party an enormous amount of power. So it doesn't have to worry, does it? If, if Dorset elects all Conservative MPs, which it does, and I'm not sure I can remember the last time there was, probably there were Lib Dem MPs here, but in 2010 elected but you know in my patch there's 55 seats and 49 of them are held by conservatives and three it was four, it was 52 before the last election 2017 although only about half the people there vote conservative so that is allowing conservative MPs to be elected when they're not very good they don't need to be good because they can just be there forever so they're just confident they're going to have that seat and obviously in other parts of the country, in, in the more industrial parts, in Manchester and so on, the same applies to Labour MPs. They have safe seats, so they don't have to be good. So I think moving towards a proportional system where the parties have less control, the parties don't control the seats, would allow politicians to be more independent of parties and more representative of the people that they're supposed to represent. So to me... There's a lot of things we need to do to change our constitution and to change the way our democracy works, but I think a fair voting system would really shape the system up. And it would, it would mean that if people weren't very good, it would make sense to vote for somebody else. Whereas at the moment, when people come to a general election, the first question they're asking themselves is who can win this seat, rather than who's the best politician. And that's why we're ending up with people who aren't the best politicians. And Although I don't like being rude about politicians in general, I don't think we've got the best politicians at the moment, and I think if we had a different way of selecting them, we'd end up with a better selection. Okay. Uh, we are going to have time for several more live questions, so please do keep your questions coming um, in the comment box. Uh, we'll take another advanced question submitted by Graham. Uh, he says, how can we stop that appalling oil rig in the bay, that's Pool Bay, from trashing our marine ecology? Yeah, this is an absolute tragedy. I mean, I was um, involved here in the discussions over Navitas Bay, and I tried my hardest to lobby so that we could have wind turbines out in the bay. And as you'll know, that was turned down because they would have looked, the argument was, you know, it would have been visually unpleasant and uh, it would have disrupted marine life. And so how extraordinary that we then are allowing this test drilling for oil, which clearly is much more visible, much closer to the coast, and causes potentially much worse damage to the marine habitat. So um, I just find that extraordinary. And also, of course, you've got the issue that we already can't use most of the oil and gas reserves we know about. So why on earth are we uh, just prospecting for even more oil and gas? I mean, climate change means we have to keep 70% of known reserves in the ground. So what would be the point of finding more? It just flies in the face of everything we know we have to do about climate change. So. Um, it's just, it's just extraordinary that that could have been given permission. And, you know, you do have to think it's about local interests and people that are going to make a profit from it, basically. What can we do to stop it? Um, obviously, I've tried, along with local Greens, objecting and writing letters and so on. But we were discussing just now, we, we were down um, looking out just through the mist, we could just about see the rig. And we were discussing the possibility of appealing to the European authorities because surely it is damaging the very special marine habitats there and the breeding grounds for seahorses particularly and if seahorses are a protected species then it's hard to see how that was given permission so that's something 
we can certainly try. But again, it comes back to the previous question in a way, because if all the representatives around this coastline are conservatives, uh, you know, they don't have a good record of, of protecting marine habitats and they don't have a good record of being concerned about the environment. So I think having a fair voting system so that you can have some stronger representation. Of course, you do have Simon Bull here, who's a, a Green councillor, and I'm very pleased to say was elected to Bournemouth Council back in 2015. And so he's been very active trying to resist the drilling. But, you know, we need many more green politicians. We need many more people who are genuinely concerned about the environment. Because if you just have a lot of conservative politicians who focus on profit first, then I'm afraid you do end up with very bad decisions, like the decision taken to allow the, the drilling of the oil rig. Okay, um, just from Barbara on her, um, the, who asked the previous question, she says, um, yes, I'd agree, they, um, politicians, are apathetic locally, God's waiting room, frustrating things. <laughs> <laughs> and um, another comment from Hayden <coughs> Rose, um, he says, we had a referendum on voting reform in 2011, it was maybe more important than Brexit, um, but only a very small number of people voted in favour, where did it go wrong? Okay, well, that, I think that's quite an easy one to answer. Because um, effectively, what we were being offered was not a proportional system, it was AV. And, you know, the projections show that if you have an AV system, the results don't differ significantly from the results we have under first past the post. Um, so the mistake was made by the Liberal Democrats, firstly, in agreeing that that should be tested in a referendum, which was their price of entering government, and secondly, agreeing to AV being the system offered. Um, because effectively what happened, and I was very active in that campaign, I was out on doorsteps every night, and what happened was people split three ways. So a third of the people supported AV, a third of the people refused to support it, you know, voted against because it wasn't proper proportional representation, and a third of the people voted against it because um, they thought first past the post was the best system. And I was, and people were telling me, I'm not going to vote for AV because it's not a proportional system. And I was saying to them, well, if you vote against it, they will just say people don't want PR and it's off the table for a generation. And that's exactly what people said, but that was not how they voted. And so that was a good example of bad democratic process, deliberately set up to answer the question the way the Conservatives wanted, rather than really assessing what people wanted in terms of the way they, they want to choose their representatives. And I would also just point out that the campaign against AV was run by Matthew Elliott, who was the same person who directed the campaign, the Vote Leave campaign, and he employed many similar tactics in terms of just totally deceitful information on leaflets. The last doorstep I was on, the night before the, the vote, uh, the referendum vote, there was a lady and she came rushing out saying, oh, you know, I really would love to have a proportional system, but you can't have PR, because look at all the trouble it's caused in Fiji, she said. I was thinking, why on earth is she talking about Fiji, you know? And then, of course, I saw the leaflet, and it was just an incredibly sort of, I mean, distorted example, I would say, of what PR does. And she just, you know, exactly like, oh, you know, the EU causes you to starve polar bears, the same kind of very precise, deceitful information that scares people into voting the wrong way and against their interests. We saw that in the AV referendum, we saw exactly the same behaviour from Vote Leave, I'm afraid to say, and what we need to have is independent uh, systems of assessing whether the information that's being given is fair, and unfortunately we have no protection against liars and charlatans in our referendum system, and that's something that really needs to change if we're going to have any more referendums, because people have to be informed to make the decisions that are in their interests, otherwise it's really undermining our whole democratic system. Okay, uh, next question is again from Emma Short, uh, representing the School Eco Committee in Dorset. Um, do you think the Green Party will have more success in general elections in the future, since young people are more environmentally aware? Is there a chance of a Green Party government? So great that you've got an Eco Committee, by the way. I didn't say that the first time, but I'm really pleased to hear that your school has an Eco Committee. Um, well, this also relates to the answer I gave to the question about how we choose our representatives. So, effectively, it's very difficult for Greens to get a majority, nationally or in any uh, local area. So, I would say, you know, if you look at the polls, it's sort of 4 or 5% of people say they'll vote Green in a, in a national election. And I would say, given that a lot of people are deciding not to vote Green because they think Greens can't win, let's say uh, there's a lot of suppressed support there, so our support might be at about 10% that's probably about the level of support we should get. So if we had a fair voting system, we would have 60 MPs. And to be honest with you, with 60 MPs, we could really transform this country. 
I sit in the European Parliament, 751 MEPs, 8.3% of them, 52 in the Green Group, and we can have an amazing impact and make a huge amount of change. So we don't actually need to be a majority, but what we need is a voting system that's fair, so that the number of people that want Green MPs get Green MPs, and we just don't have that at the moment. Now let's just compare this with the situation in Sweden, where they've recently agreed a government, it's a coalition between various parties, they needed the Greens to get the majority to be able to run the country. So even though the Greens only got about 4% of the vote, and therefore 4% of the representatives, because they have a fair voting system, they were able to get some really important action on climate change into the manifesto, into the governing platform for that government. So, you know, that's how politics works, and that's how Greens can really transform society when you have a system that's fair. And you could imagine in this country having a, a government that was a red-green government, like they've had in Germany, for example. And, you know, I think Labour has a lot to offer, and sometimes they adopt green policies, but I personally would much rather have green uh, ministers in government implementing those policies. And we could have an extraordinary transformational policy in terms of energy, you know, renewable energy, addressing some of the really serious social problems that we face, tackling inequality, building quality housing for people, you know, the sort of policies Greens want to introduce, we could happily introduce in coalition with a, with a Labour government. So I'm not saying it has to be a fully Green government, but I think a, a Labour Green government could really do amazing things, and that's exactly what you're seeing in other European countries. So what holds us back is this ridiculously unfair voting system, which means that even though lots of people vote Green, you know, 2 million people in 2015 voted Green, we got one seat. The average to elect a, a Labour member, I think, was about 100,000, so it's just a totally unfair system. Okay, um, so we've got people tuning in all the time. Uh, we will have time for a few more live questions, so please do keep them coming in the comments box. Uh, we'll take another advanced question from Elizabeth Elwick, who says, I don't think I'm being too pessimistic in thinking that Brexit will happen, sadly, with or without a deal. It feels like jumping off a cliff. How can we effectively challenge the anti-green decisions being made locally, such as fracking, and nationally in this type of political environment? Mm -hmm. So, um, I've said already I don't think we are going to go out with no deal. I mean, I know that the Prime Minister is threatening us with that, which is a grossly irresponsible thing to do, but I don't think we should allow that to force us to take the bad deal that she's negotiated. I think we should stick out for the fact that we know Brexit isn't in the best interest of this country. 55% of people in a poll from the Daily Mail, so a poll where they presumably wanted people to say they supported Brexit, even in that poll, 55% of people said they thought remaining in the EU was the best option. So in other words, the majority in this country do not want to leave the EU. And if we're a democracy, that majority should have their way. So we mustn't give up hope of being able to reverse the decision taken by the referendum. In fact, it's not even reversing the decision. It's, it's people saying, yes, I'd like to leave. Now we've defined what leaving looks like. Is that still what they want? We absolutely have to have that check. And I believe if we did have that second referendum, then we'd be able to win it and we would actually stay in the EU. But you're right that if we do go ahead and leave, it's really quite worrying in terms of the sort of people that will have power. And I've organised a couple of websites where I describe the sort of things they'd like to achieve. One's called the Bad Boys of Brexit. That tells you who are the players behind the Brexit campaign. And the second one's called the Brexit Syndicate. And that's more about what they're doing now to reorganise and redesign our country in their interests and against our interests. And so... It would be, I think, difficult to protect the environment because the people we're talking about here, for example, a lot of them are climate deniers, a lot of them are the sort of people who would dismiss environmental protection as red tape and they feel we should tear that up and just let business do what it wants to. And, you know, they're the sort of people that may not even live in Britain. You know, they probably have their money offshore, they don't want to pay tax. They're a tiny elite of very wealthy people who will use the opportunity of Brexit to undermine the standards and principles and values that we fought for uh, through 150 years of democracy. So this is why we shouldn't give up hope of stopping Brexit, because everything we want to achieve as Greens, everything we want to achieve as decent people for a society that works for everybody is going to be so much more difficult outside the European Union. So please don't give up hope. I'm convinced we can still stop Brexit, and I think if we all work together and we know that that's not only in the best interest of the country, but also what the majority of people in this country want, then it's absolutely our right to stay in the EU. Please don't give up hope. Okay, um, 
Barbara Leonard again uh, on the comments, uh, picking up on what you were saying, says, um, any real chance of a green alliance with another party? Well, at the moment, um, Labour are an incredibly tribal party and it's very difficult working with them. So at the last election, we started what, a negotiation we called the Progressive Alliance, reaching out to other parties that wanted to stop the appalling Tory Brexit to say, let's work together to try and make sure we undermine the Tories' majority so they can't carry out these appalling plans. And that was quite effective, because in various places, strategically, we stood down so other people could win their seats. But the problem was, neither Labour nor, sadly, the Liberal Democrats were prepared to stand down in our favour. And so, you know, we're, we're prepared to work together to reach out, but it can only work if other parties will do that as well. And the other parties, unfortunately, are extremely tribal, and they put party before country. And I think we're seeing that with Brexit, quite honestly. But um, the truth is, in order to have a cooperative government with more than one party, we have to change the way our electoral system works. So this majoritarian system is a particularly British thing. It only really exists in, in Britain and in countries that used to be our colonies, so we left them with that system. And some countries, like New Zealand, have then moved on to better systems. And in most countries, you have like you know six or seven parties in the parliament, and then they make coalitions, different coalitions at different times, to govern the country. And if we had a system like that, a multi-party system with a proportional election voting system, uh, then I think coalitions will be inevitable. And in that future, which I think really we have to fight for and have to make sure we do get, then I think it's inevitable that Greens will be in government before very long. Okay, um, we'll take uh, one more from Emma Short, another excellent question, uh, representing the local school eco committee. Um, how do we influence the behaviour of large international corporations which are the greatest polluters? Is this beyond the realm of national politics? That is indeed a very good question and that's one of the most important questions for our time I would say. So in my work in the European Parliament I do already do this um, and the European Competition Commission who's called Margrethe Vestheyen is from Denmark She's been very active controlling the power of companies like Google and Apple, making sure they pay their taxes, but also making sure they compete fairly with other companies. But I think perhaps the most important thing we need to do is to operate, and, and I think your, the premise of your question is quite right, which is to say that you can't do this at national level, you have to have cooperation. So I can see the way the European Union is already effective in resisting the power of corporations, but what we really need to do is to have global agreement about the minimum standards that corporations have to meet. And there is a proposal to do that, which is called the Binding Treaty on Business and Human Rights, and it's being negotiated by the Human Rights Committee of the UN. And I was really lucky to be able to go to Geneva as part of the debate about that back in October. And basically what that would be is a, is a piece of law saying what are the minimum standards that companies have to meet in order, um, you know, not to be sued actually, in order to be legal on a global basis under the UN auspices, so the global body where nations come together to agree what, na what international policies should be like. And then it would have a court attached, so if then a corporation, no matter where you live, no matter how poor you were, if a corporation invaded your human rights, you could then take a case to the court and you'd be supported legally to do that. So if you think of the example just recently where there was a Brazilian mining company uh, which had kept a whole lot of waste water, with, you know, contaminated waste water behind a dam and the dam broke and hundreds of people have died as a result of that. I met some people from a very similar community, but I think only about 25 people died. It was a very similar accident about three years ago, and the same company involved. And they came to tell me about what had happened to their community. And at that time, we talked about the need for this um, UN binding treaty. And uh, you know, when I heard about that disaster, again, I thought if we had that sort of international law, then the companies wouldn't behave like that. I mean, it's no good people who've died, you know, and their families having to go to court. I mean, the point is not that they can then get recompense if somebody's died or been injured. The point is that the companies who know that, that they would be liable for those deaths and injuries, they then would improve their behaviour. So that's, so to me, that's the most important thing we're focused on at the moment. And you can find out more about that. At the moment, France is supporting that proposal, but no other European countries are. So we have to really get a lobby going to make sure that Europe starts to agree that co corporations should meet those standards. And I think, you know, it's going to take a while, but it's a, it's a way of solving the problem of, of corporations 
really destroying lives across the world as they do now. Okay, um, I think we're going to have time for one or two extra live questions, so please do keep them coming. Um, and a quick follow-up from Emma. Uh, do you agree that vegetarianism is a way to protect the environment? That's a really interesting question. I mean, it's a really interesting question for somebody who's the MEP for South West England, where we have a lot of farming, and particularly cattle and dairy farming. So I really have to battle the interests of people who, for animal welfare reasons, think we shouldn't have uh, meat or dairy, and for environmental reasons, think we shouldn't have meat or dairy, and also the interests of farmers. And so the Green Party's policy on this is that we should move towards a plant-based diet. So it's not saying no more meat and dairy all become vegan from tomorrow, but it is saying we all need to eat less meat, but basically because the meat production system is cruel to animals in many cases and also impacts negatively on the environment in terms of climate change. And we also, of course, expect much higher standards of animal husbandry for animals that are there and, and better animal welfare. And so I, I quite like that way of approaching it because it's just encouraging people to shift their behaviour over time and it's actually being incredibly effective. So if you think about Veganuary this year, you know, a few years ago that was quite an extreme thing and it was a tiny number of people who were involved in that. But this year you can see that lots of people have taken it up and, you know, lots of companies as well. In fact, an awful lot of the chains, chain restaurants, have brought out a special menu and, you know, everybody's learning how to cook vegetable meals better and... So I think this year I've really thought we're starting to make some movement on this and it's been positive because it's like been an opportunity to try something different rather than like, oh, Greens say you mustn't do this, Greens say you mustn't do that. So I think it's important we keep it in that kind of space. And also as somebody who works on the Agriculture Committee and represents a lot of farmers, I think it's important that we support farmers to move towards vegetable growing because actually a lot of them just don't have experience of that. And so they, you know, you know, we're used to seeing, you go, you, you drive along a road or you're on a train or something, you're looking at, it's all grass, which means it's grazing land, which means it's about dairy or meat production. What would the world look like? What would the southwest look like if most people were growing vegetables? Actually, it will be a lot of mud and polytunnels when you look out of the train window. And so, you know, it's quite an adjustment how our countryside would look and what the farming industry would be like if we were all mostly eating vegetables and so I think it's it's something we need to move towards <coughs> but we're not going to do it overnight and um, I think what we need really is a, a vision for where farming is going where our food and farming system is going redesigning that system and really focusing on that as a priority rather than just sort of going to a supermarket and buying a bag of lentils which might have come from the other side of the world and have different kinds of environmental impacts so I'm really interested in this question and it's something I would like to to work on more, um, but I don't think it's, I, I think the principle of moving towards plant-based diets is a really good principle, and then we need to follow through on redesigning our food and farming system to follow that. Okay, uh, so we'll take a, another advanced question submitted by Susan Chapman in Bournemouth, and she says, how do we persuade our council to turn from mad growth and prioritise mother nature educate, incentivise and motivate for our climate emergency and help provide serious amounts of clean energy, food and shelter as our soils fail, cliffs collapse and we are flooded out of our homes. Oh, that sounds a little bit... I, I know Sue. Hello Sue, if you're there. Um, so, I think the most important thing to say is when people are scared, they don't make good decisions. So personally, I don't present people with a catastrophe and then say, look, you need to do something about that. Because I think that's not how people respond well. It's also not how I respond well, to be honest with you. And so I think what I'm trying to achieve is a rapid transition away from the unsustainable way we're living now to a more sustainable future. And so I think that's about industrial transformation, investment in the energies of the future. For example, why aren't we manufacturing wind turbines here? We've never encouraged an industry, we know we're moving towards a renewable future, but we've never encouraged any sort of um, industry to support that transition. You probably know already that I'm working on sustainable finance, and that's a really important agenda again, saying that if you've got any money in a pension fund, or if you've got money, um, life insurance, whatever, that money, you should have knowledge about where that money's invested, because you'd probably find, you'd be horrified if you knew where that money was really invested, and we're going to make sure that information is much more openly available, so people can start to shift their money um, in the direction of sustainable industries, for example. And also we need to make sure that, 
you know, the financial incentives for people to invest in the energies of the future. But um, I think that life is going to be transformed in many ways, and I think one of the most important things we need to do is sort of cut the connection between your job and having a comfortable life. This isn't just about the green future, it's also about the fact that automation means that many of the jobs that people are doing now simply won't be necessary. So we have to find a way of taking the value from the economy and transferring it to people through a citizen's income, through fair sharing of that value, rather than saying to people, you have to find a job that's often at the moment an unsustainable job, but without that you are then um, oppressed in a very unsupportive welfare system. So I think that idea that there's like jobs no matter how bad or you're a welfare scrounger, that's a really negative way of conceptualising people's need for a, a comfortable livelihood and that's something else that we really need to change because in the green future people will be working less but they still need to have a sense of dignity and role in the community and sufficient money to live a comfortable life. So, you know, it's a big question, you know, I've written books about this in the past, so it's quite hard to summarise in a short answer, but those are some of the things I think we should be doing. Okay, and uh, finally, a uh, very handy way to wrap up, uh, from Sarah Bedford, are you looking forward to this evening's debate at Bournemouth University? <laughs> so I've started this series of debates on... Um, basically fighting fascism. I mean, I've been aware for some time since, I would say, the Brexit referendum of the way in which the far right is growing in this country. And obviously then I went off to the European Parliament and actually had experience of working with genuine fascists from other countries. Um, and some of the UKIP members there I would also classify as fascists. And so we had <coughs> quite a strong sense of concern in my team about what was happening to our democracy and the rise of these um, yeah, far right tendencies, and we started thinking, well, what are we really dealing with here? You know, how do we define fascism? And so, what we've tried to do is to look at how other people who've studied both totalitarian communism and fascism, and how they've not only defined what fascism is, but also found ways to resist it. And so, we decided to produce some leaflets and some beer mats, which are very welcome to have as well, and you can deposit in various well known pubs. And the point of the debates is to just get everybody thinking about it, moving from that sort of vague sense of unease that something's going seriously wrong with our democracy to thinking about how they can defend democracy and challenge the rise of the far right. And so this is the fifth and last one of these talks that I've been giving and each time I'm joined by a, a panel of different speakers and um, academics who study the far right or journalists who are very focused on the need to support the truth and stop the disinformation and propaganda that the far right use, or other politicians who also want to challenge the rise of the far right. And so what's interesting to me is that I've been involved in these debates in different communities across the southwest and with different uh, panellists. And uh, yeah, it's been really interesting and I think the most surprising thing is that you spend an evening talking about fascism and everybody goes away saying, oh that was so uplifting, which I didn't expect, I've got to say, but that has been the reaction. So if, you, if you're able, there's still seats available, you can come and join us. and learn how to resist fascism. It'll be fun, I promise. Okay. Okay, so, is that you? Well, that's me. I'm going to say <laughs> So, if you're free this evening, and within reach of Bournemouth University Talbot campus, I'm going to be speaking at this session. It starts at half past seven, and it's called People in Power, Populism, Fascism, and How to Defend Democracy. There's a few, a few tickets still available. You will have to book, and you can look on the Eventbrite site, but if you can't cope with that, I expect we'll let you in anyway. Uh, you can find the booking link in a post earlier today on the Bournemouth Green Party Facebook page, and it'd be really nice to see you there. And if you're interested in my work, do follow me on Facebook or Twitter. My Twitter handle is at MollyMEP. Thanks very much for tuning in today, and goodbye for now. Hope to see you later.